I'm Vanda Crift, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Santa Chris. Find all of the archives of the show at HankGarner.com. If you find some episodes that you like in the archives, would you do me a favor and share those with your friends, family, and loved ones? I would really appreciate that. I hope you enjoy all the great shows that we bring you. And the reason we're able to bring you such great content is because of our sponsors. And I would like to thank some of those sponsors. If you would like to sponsor the show and highlight your product or service to our audience, go to hanggarner.com and there's a link in the menu there at the top that says Advertise. And you can highlight your product or service to our audience. Nick Breaker's book, Essence. Book one, Septima. One of the best science fiction writers I know. Nick Breaker weaves some of the best science fiction adventure stories you'll ever read. Essence, book one, Septima, is a must-read. Go pick it up today. There's a link to it in the show notes. Third Scribe is the place for authors and readers to meet. Go to thirdscribe.com. You can set up an account for free, and you can link up with some of your favorite authors and find out what's going on with them. Authors, you need to have a place where you can highlight your books to your audience. Thirdscribe.com is built especially around books, linking people that love books with people that write books. Go visit them today. Thirdscribe.com. Tell Robin the folks that I sent you. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. Episode 20 just dropped today. It is amazing with stories by Jess West, Rhett Bruno, Eamon Ambrose, Bob Williams. Tales is my favorite monthly publication. Go pick it up today and get that old pulp goodness feeling. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode number 20, out right now. Also, don't forget, uh, we're highlighting Tales of Dystopia this week, and we've got a special interview show with some of the authors from it, but Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia, 13 stories of animals and humans interacting at the end of the world. Uh, This project also benefits Pets for Vets, one of uh, the most outstanding charities out there, linking up rescue animals with veterans that need some companionship. So go pick up a copy of Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia. It's only 99 cents while it launches. At the end of the show, don't forget we have an audio book clip from Richard Cleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to bring you a show with Vanda Kreft. She has a new book, a phenomenal book called The Man Who Made the Movies. If you are interested in in movies or the entertainment business at all, or even uh, writers out there, uh, there are so many lessons that can be learned and gleaned uh, from from this man's story who's kind of been relegated to the the cobwebby corners of the entertainment industry. But you know what? Vanda Kreft has done the hard work to uh, to bring the story back out, the story of the rise and fall of William Fox. Uh, so we're going to get all into that in just a minute. But welcome to the show, Vanda. Thank you very much, Hank. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so thank excited. Thank you for that fabulous introduction. Oh, oh you're, you're mm-hmm. so welcome. Um, we begin each show with the same question, and, and we can't move on until we answer the question. And okay. uh, mm-hmm. the first question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? I don't have one distinct memory, but I have a general memory of being very young. And I would say it's, it's more of wanting to be a writer. And it was just that when I was young, I was extremely shy and I was just terrified of speaking in class. And so I realized, hey, if I'm not going to fail, I need to do something to compensate for this. So that's when I really started to develop 
I would say my my writing ability really just as a way of compensating for extreme shyness. Um, and then I found that I was just in general fascinated by stories, and I loved to read. My parents would take me to the library every every weekend and get out books, and I just loved to stand there and look at all the books and all the stories that were contained there. And I remember like really wishing that I could read every single book in the library and having a rather disheartening thought of that's probably not going to be possible because I'm not going to live that long. But anyway. Oh, uh, I, I know the feeling. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, yes. it, does, it does not get better as you get older uh, because there's so many fantastic books coming out. And, yeah. and and you quickly mm-hmm. realize, oh man, I'm 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 like middle age now, and uh, mm-hmm. I, there's no way I'll be able to read all the books that I want to read. Know. I know. As, <laughs> as soon as I finish them, ten more come out. I know. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I completely uh, understand that feeling, though, of being a kid and just wanting to inhale all of the books. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. What were some of those first stories that that you remembered that just really captivated your imagination and, and maybe transported you to another place? Well, as uh, sort of simplistic as this is probably going to make me sound, but I love the Nancy Drew stories, you know, as a, as a child. I And I remember that everybody my age, I mean, what were we, like sort of third grade, second, third grade, everybody would have some of the books and we would all trade them and you'd get on a list of you know, you're going to be third in line to read this one. So we were really passionate readers. Um, I I think probably the first um, kind of truly adult book that I remember reading was um, Thackeray's Vanity Fair. And of course, that is a very sizable tome. Um, But I was just pulled into that and I just remember I couldn't stop reading it and it sure didn't seem long uh, because the story was so absorbing and I really felt I knew those people, those characters. So that to me was kind of the best reading experience is where I feel as if I live in that world and I really, really don't want to book the book. I don't want the story to end. I don't want to have to say goodbye to those people. Oh, I, I know that feeling. You, uh, you just... Yeah, that, that is, especially when uh, when done as well as Vanity Fair, where you just uh, you become part of the story yourself, and you don't want to don't mm-hmm. want to walk out of that. Right. Um, mm-hmm. um, and don't feel bad about Nancy Drew. That is, you know that's that's epic. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. and so many great detective tales, you know, began there. And and uh, you know, I feel like uh, when I'm reading the man who made the movies that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's a bit of a detective story. It's a, it's a biography of course, but, um, you know, you, you found, uh, this guy and, and really did the homework to uncover, uh, as we like to say here, the story behind the stories. And, uh, mm-hmm. so I, I could, uh, I could see where, you know, that's a natural outgrowth of, of beginning with Nancy Drew. Yes. I, I think that's, that's really a, um, a, a quite a brilliant observation because that's exactly what it felt like. It felt like doing detective work and, you know, putting the pieces of information together and then sort of sifting them and saying, well, is that really plausible? Do I believe that? Um, And where's the evidence for that? Or does another explanation make sense? And then where do I find the evidence for that? So that, that's exactly what it felt like. Just, you know, ferreting out the information. Right. Right. Um, You have, uh, you've worked in, in other uh, corners and facets of the publishing industry um, before yes. writing this book. Uh, mm-hmm. When when did you decide that writing uh, was going to be a profession or that, that you knew that you were going to work in journalism or, or publishing? Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of when did that decision take root? Mm, great question. Um, when I was in college, uh, I was an English major and okay. I chose that major because I realized, hey, you can actually graduate and get a degree by reading novels, that's for me. Um, <laughs> I love it. You know, because I was going to do that anyway. So, exactly. you know, that, that was pleasure for me. And then looking at, okay, uh, now what do I do after graduation? I need to earn a living. And the logical step was, okay, why don't I write? I also love to read magazines, and there were, you know, many more back then. Um and so I thought, okay, why don't I just, why don't I do that? And my first job was working at a small Catholic paper in Toronto. So I went to school at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and then 
um, I actually was born in Canada, so that was why I was able to go back to Canada. Um, and so that was where my journalism career started. And then from there, I was a reporter at the Bergen Record in Hackensack, New Jersey, in northern New Jersey. And that was a fun and interesting adventure. And then I just decided I had too much cold, too much of the cold weather. And that's, and I came to California. And so I am in Santa Monica now, and that's where I've been for seemingly ever. So, and that's when I began a freelance journalism career, writing mostly about the entertainment industry for magazines, for national magazines usually. So that's really, I think, where the the focus on the entertainment industry started. And so I did that for, for quite some time. Um, what were some of the, uh, the first things that you learned as a journalist uh, that surprised you? Uh, it, when you're fresh out of college and you say, okay, well, I'm going mm-hmm. to write. Um, when you mm-hmm. actually started doing it for a living and uh, mm-hmm. this is more than just a, you know, a creative writing assignment in college and, uh, uh, you know, where you're working toward a grade, but, the, but there's, there's so much of your own creativity in it. When, when you're actually handed an assignment and you're like, mm-hmm. okay, well, I have to write uh, – you know, uh, as an assignment, and I have to do it uh, to someone else's specifications. Um, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. w- was that a big shift for you, and, and how did you adjust in that? Yes, absolutely. And I think you have hit on really the key point is writing two specifications. And I remember that the first articles that I wrote, I really had no idea what I was doing, and I felt completely lost because I didn't know what that form was. And so those, you know, the the first ones that I wrote were just painful to to write. And then what I found is that there really is very much of a formula that you're writing to. And once you pick it up, you can almost write your story beforehand in the sense that, well, when I was at the Bergen Record, we had to cover the local, the city councils and the school board and, uh, you know, the planning board, et cetera, et cetera. And you could set the story up beforehand because you'd have to go to your meeting, which would typically be from about 8 to 11, and then you'd have to come back to the office and file the story that very same night. So, you know, it was really the the same thing. If you say the school board voted something or against thing, your lead is still going to be basically the same. It's just going to be, okay, which way did they vote? And then the... That very structured from that point onwards as to you get your quote, you, you know, why did it happen this way? And so once I picked that up, it became much easier, I would say. So I, I think um, it's kind of the biggest surprise to me was the degree of crap that's involved as opposed to, you know, what you meant before, creativity. Um, you have you can be good, but only within bounds. And then when I was writing freelance magazines, I, I remember you know the, one of the questions was, or one of the considerations was always, our readers want to know. So the editor would have in mind here's our reader, and it would be a very specific portrait of that reader, and that reader would have very specific interests that you would have to write to. So. But, you know, those are skills that every author uh, ought to have to go through uh, because, uh, you know, if you're if you're going to write and have a book that is successful and is going to connect with the, with an audience, then you ought to know who your audience is. Um, you know, there are you know certain folks that capture lightning in a bottle and they, mm-hmm. there's these kind of odd books and, and they uh, somehow resonate with a with a wide audience. Uh, but most of the time, you know, those things are the exceptions to the rule. Uh, because they're exceptions. Uh, most of us, when we're writing, need to know who we're writing for, uh, and so that we can serve that audience well. Because uh, if you're writing just into the ether, you're not you're not doing anything for anybody. You know, if you uh, mm-hmm. if you write something that that's not targeted towards someone, uh, you can have the most beautiful prose in the world, and if you aren't prepared to actually have someone read it, um, then it's just kind of a uh, an exercise in futility. Uh, so yes. it's, it seems as an author, those are great skills to have kind of learned in the trenches early on. Yeah, I, I think so. Because you, you have to remember that communication, you know, is a, that it's a process and there's somebody on the, at the other end, you know, you, you're not just expressing yourself. You're trying to reach somebody and, to, and then to some extent you have to really put yourself in the, that person and think, what do they want to know? about this subject and then write to that, I think, 
At least that's what I've tried to do. Right. Um, so, so you wind up on the West Coast and you're mm-hmm. working, reporting on the entertainment industry. How did you uh, make that make that transition? Well, it was the one thing. Given magazines were based in New York, it was really the one thing that people couldn't do in New York. So, for other kinds of stories, I've had to compete with writers who, you know, if I could go out to lunch with the editor of the magazine or stop by the office. But if you focus on the entertainment industry, they pretty much have to hire somebody out on the West Coast. So, I realized that that would be a, a, a better way for me to really earn a living as a, as a magazine journalist. So, cause of course, the whole industry is centered out here, and so you get to know that machinery and that set of people. You make your contacts and get your story pitches uh, together. So that's and, – and also, of course, I was very interested in film and television and the entertainment industry in general. So that was why I really chose that uh, that specialty. And, and I think the sort of the stories were easier to market. You could syndicate them as well. There'd be a broader interest in them. So – that's I, it was mainly a practical decision, I would say. Gotcha. Uh, what types of stories were you writing? Mostly uh, celebrity interviews, actually. Okay. So and so has a movie coming out, and they're promoting the movie. Um, and of course, you you know you always have to sort of accommodate that, but then you're trying to get what is that person's story or something interesting about them as a person. But the reason they would be available for the interview is that they've got something to sell. I, I don't know any. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything mm-hmm. about that. Um, oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't know until I started doing it. I always thought, oh, you know, they just have a, they're just sitting around and they decide to talk to a journalist. But no, it would be. It was always pegged to some sort of a project. You know, they they have a TV show that's going to be debuting, or more typically, they're going to be coming out, and they are either on the circuit to promote it, or they're, you know, they're giving uh, select publications interviews. So it was very much pegged to what uh, some project that they had. Right, and, and it's always fun to to kind of uh, dig around a little bit and find, like you said, that that thing that that makes them interesting as a person. Uh, that yes. that's more mm-hmm. than just recycling a press release and uh, and and really uh, helping the audience connect on a deeper level with the with the artist. Yes, correct, correct. Because what what you're always kind of in that position, you're always kind of in a bit of an adversarial relationship with the publicists who of course want to present you only the, you know, the rosiest picture and they only want you, you know, they want you only to talk about the movie or the TV show, but of course you don't want to do that. So you have to, you know, spend a lot of time at the library researching the people beforehand, trying to, you know, find the interesting points um, to talk about from their life. So. Right. So at at what point did you uh, begin to get interested in William Fox? Yeah, great question. Um, as And that actually meshes with what we were talking about with the magazine journalism uh, career. I met, during the course of that, a, a woman named Angela Fox Dunn. She was also an entertainment freelance journalist. And so we crossed paths in a number of ways, and she turned out to be William Fox's niece. She was the daughter of his youngest sister, Malvina, who was 20-some years younger than he was. Um, and so, and she knew him uh, because he would come out here in the winters and he'd stay. He was always based in New York, but he would spend several months of the year out in Los Angeles. And she and her family, Angela and her family, lived in L.A., so they would visit quite a bit. So she actually knew him and she was the last person alive who knew him well. So, and and she was a wonderful storyteller herself. So she had many stories about Fox and about the whole family. And I just could sit there and listen to her for hours, tell these, tell these stories. And for the longest time, I just assumed well, you know, William Fox, he has a studio named after him. He founded the studio. Surely someone has done the biography. And then I realized no one had. And that's when I decided, you know, I was really tired of magazines. They were a dying business even, you know, 15 years ago. 
And so actually I went uh, back to school. I went uh, to get a master's in communication. And in the process of writing a thesis, I realized how much I really loved to do in-depth research, which you can't do for a magazine article because it's just not cost effective. So in, in doing the thesis, I realized, you know, I, that's what I should do is some larger project. And then I thought, well, what subject should I do? And that's when the pieces came together. And I realized, hey, I wonder if anybody has done William Fox. And I realized, no, they hadn't. So I felt that with the connection to Angela, that there was a basis for me perhaps having a unique or some sort of special insight into this character so that he wasn't somebody just completely remote where I wouldn't necessarily be able to trust my assessment of the remaining information. You know, it's really crazy, Vanda, is that as I'm thumbing through um, your book and, and your publisher was, was so gracious in sending us an advanced copy to to, uh, to look through, um, the, the book is like 900 pages, and, and I'm not exaggerating. It's a huge book. <laughs> um, it's it's massive. Well, well, well can, can I just interject yes. one thing? Yes. There are a hundred and some of those pages are endnotes, so it's really only like 750 pages of oh, the that, story. That's yes, so, so much better. That's so much yes. better. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, I, I had a, a similar experience to you as I'm sitting there thumbing through the book. It, it's almost a, a Mandela effect uh, type thing where I'm sitting there thumbing through and like, a, a I've heard this story before. I think surely I've heard. Or, and then it's, well, well mm-hmm. surely, surely I know about about this story. And then you realize, no, I don't know anything about this story. Although I've, you know, can walk around whistling the 20th century Fox, you know, fanfare at the beginning of every Fox movie I've ever watched. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I've seen my entire life, you know, Fox studio movies, and I know nothing about, uh, the man Fox. And it was, mm-hmm. it was such a bizarre, um, experience to kind of, uh, to, to read through the book and then realize that, that I, that I didn't know anything about it, and then like you, uh, how did you know, how did it go so long without the story being told? Um, uh, so so where did you begin when you came to this realization that that the story had not been told? Um, mm-hmm. You obviously have this uh, this this f- uh, f- close family connection that you had made. Um, uh, where do you begin? Well. I knew that it was, okay, so I knew that I wanted to write a book, and I knew that this was an important subject. You know, why has he not been done? Why do we know Louis V. Mayer? We know the Warner Brothers. They've been done many times. We know Carl Emily at Universal, but why don't we know William Fox? So that was where I, I knew that this was probably going to be, could probably make something out of this. And then I, as a starting point, I started with many of the misconceptions that are out there to the slight extent that Fox's story is out there. And the way that his story has been told is that, yes, he started Fox Film in 1915, and then he got greedy in 1929, and he bought Lowe's Incorporated, the parent company of MGM, and it was a foolish thing to do. He didn't have the money, and then the stock market crashed, and he lost his companies, but he deserved to lose them. So who cares about him? Um, and, and that was the way that I approached the story. I thought, okay, it's the story of somebody who gets overly ambitious, you know, who starts with nothing, builds up a great company, and then uh, sort of, you know, goes beyond, goes off the rails somewhat, and and that and uh, falls from grace. And okay, I thought I can make a story out of that. You know, that's um, it's a little cliched, but if that's what it is, then it's a dramatic story, at least. And then, um, so so I knew that there was something there. But the more that I dug into the story, the more I realized it's far more complex than that. And that's really not even true. That he it really wasn't his fault. It's so it's really more. The story I found grew from being just this story of one person's tragic mistake into the um, sort of betrayal by the American dream, I would say. 
and that he believed so ardently in it. And there was the system was not what he believed it to be. And there was a fair amount of corruption. And yes, he certainly did make mistakes in judgment, but he was enmeshed in a very corrupt financial system at that time, the late 1920s. And a lot of really dirty tricks were played on him. And, And then he was just heartbroken. And another part of the story then from that point forward is that he declared bankruptcy and and one often sees that it's written about as he was bankrupt, which he wasn't. He still had millions of dollars um, and that he bribed a federal judge. And so we look, I think, you know, we look back with a contemporary perspective on that and we think, oh, how terrible, you know, to, he, he must have been a really awful person to do that. But if, when I went back and looked at what actually was the context of that action, the federal judicial system was very corrupt. The FBI had an investigation going and the judge whom Fox bribed had actually solicited the bribe. So, you know, he was so, so he was the instigator of that. So the story um just took on many, many layers and and that kept it you know, that kept it fascinating for me because I felt every time I imposed an assumption on this story, I very often found out I was wrong. And the evidence is sitting there saying, no, you need to rethink this. That's not what happened. Or this piece of information doesn't fit with that. And and that was, so that was, that was a really interesting challenge to face at many points. And that really kept the story, I think, alive and and. Um, you know, very engrossing for me. We know there, there's something very compelling uh, about a tragedy and, and mm-hmm. watching someone else's demise and, uh, and, and, and getting to live vicariously um, through the bad things that we hope never happened to us. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, maybe that's one of the things that we, that, that make tragedies, uh, you know, as, uh, as resilient and, and, and why we always come back to those types of stories. Um, but uh, one thing that we like more than a tragedy is uh, is a redemption story, uh, yeah. and and even if the, if it's not a traditional redemption, but a redemption of someone's character after the fact, um, mm-hmm. that we we thought this about William Fox, but but maybe there's more to it than that, and we get to walk away from the book thinking, um, you know, it's. Uh, it, it's almost like he's been redeemed, uh, e- even if it's posthumously. Um, mm-hmm. you know, did you have some of that feeling as you were uncovering the story? Oh, definitely. And that was one of the most interesting interesting parts of the story to me. You know, yes, it was interesting to see how he built this studio basically out of nothing, and how he built it up to the you know to the height of prosperity in the in the late twenties, but. On a personal level, I found it really interesting to see how he coped with not being able to be the person that he really wanted to be, because he lost control of his companies in April 1930, and that was as a result of this very vicious battle, this financial battle that we um, referred to earlier, and he had to let go of his companies. And he tried to make a comeback. He couldn't make a comeback. And then his successors drove his companies into the ground. And I think that was heartbreaking. And that just, and and from that point, that's where I think he just fell apart. Um, And that was in the mid 30s. And that led to that incident of filing for bankruptcy because he wasn't bankrupt, at least not financially. I think maybe emotionally or psychologically he was bankrupt, and this was a way of expressing it. Um, So he filed for bankruptcy, and then he bribed the federal judge on that case to make decisions that would go in the direction that he wanted. But he, so so there we, you know, we see him really falling. um, But he knew that he felt very guilty about that afterwards. And it was not at all consistent with his character before. I think it was just, you know, just really a heartbroken person who was 
felt very betrayed by the American system. You know, when he felt he had done so much and given so much of himself and then had unfairly lost what he had built up. And so the redemption comes in. So then he, you know, he he does this criminal act, bribing the judge, but he confessed. The, the FBI, of course, found out about it because it had had its eye on the judge, so found out about it, indicted Fox and the judge and the judge's bag man, the intermediary, and Fox confessed. Um, he did not want, he felt bad about having cast this dark cloud over his family and, um, you know, ruined their honorable reputation. And he said he wanted to cleanse his soul. So he confessed and he was the key witness against the judge and the bag man in two trials which sadly resulted in hung juries, and I suspect that was because the judge and was so corrupt that he was able to fix those juries. Um, that, you know, it's really sort of the evidence is not absolutely solid, but it really points in that direction. Anyway, so there is, you know, William Fox, who had always dreamed of being a great uh, sort of industrial statesman, you know, somebody who would be truly a leader of American society and somebody that you'd really look up to. I think he wanted to be somebody like a Rockefeller or a Carnegie, Carnegie or a Morgan. And here he was a criminal and sent off to prison. He went to prison for, um, he was sentenced for a year and I believe he served about five months. So he, he had, you know, he he was never going to be the person that he wanted to be. And how do you make a comeback from that? Like, how do you put the pieces of your life back together again? And he did. And so it's a very quiet period of his life when he came out of prison in 43, at the spring of 43, and he went he went back to the sort of work that he could do. He still owned a camera company, and he would go and spend time overseeing that. And he, you know, spent time with his family and the FBI. And then he applied for a pardon. And so the FBI did an investigation, and everybody that they interviewed said he's a family man. He's, you know, he's conducting himself impeccably. He really deserves to be pardoned. So that I found was really quite touching. You know, he was not, he'd come to terms with, with his experience. He did not seem to be angry or bitter um, or, you know, I, that seemed to have gone out of him. He was just making the best of what he had and being good to his family. So I, I found that to be really uh, an indication of character and of admirable character in in a way that you might not get with somebody who never did fall off, you know, fall from grace. What's really interesting, uh, Vanda, and, and there was no way for you to know this uh, when you began this project, uh, but mm -hmm. you've got this this book that's coming out now uh, that is this uh, – this uh, fabulous fall from grace uh, in Hollywood and mm -hmm. in his personal redemption. Uh, and we are going through an immense amount of turmoil uh, in Hollywood right now. Uh, do, do you see any parallels uh, as to what was happening in this very corrupt uh, time of the 1920s and 30s and what we're kind of seeing now with a lot of the stories coming out and a lot of uh, people that, uh, you know, had previously been uh, held in such high esteem. Uh, now we're, we're finding out have been involved in some unsavory and, uh, you know, ab abusive uh, behaviors. Do, do you draw any parallels? Well, that's, that's really interesting because I did think of when all the Harvey Weinstein accusations came out and and followed by all of the other people right. it, it really William Fox stands in stark contrast to that I will say he was always I found many quotes from the actresses who worked with him and they all said the same thing he was a gentleman and I think the casting couch was very much 
in operation back there in those times, in the teens and the 20s. And so it wasn't as if, you know, he was just following the standard conduct of the day. Um, but these actresses all said, you know, he was a gentleman, he was nice to them, um, and, you know, he was not one of those guys who would maul you. And even, and we must remember that he had some of the most beautiful women on the screen at under contract. So, and he had absolute control of the studio, which is so unusual, which meant that if you really wanted to advance your career, that would be a person you, you know, might go after, or he, you know, could be in a position to really take advantage of it. And I never found even a whisper of that sort of scandal about him, even though people accused him later, you know, of everything else, of a lot of financial misconduct, which wasn't true. Um, but, you know, they, they were hurling any sort of accusation at him that they could, but nobody ever even tried that one. I think it would have just been just com so completely implausible. It was so contrary to what his reputation was. Um, m my friend Angela, his niece, said that there was a story that he once fired an executive for swearing in front of a female secretary. <laughs> I <And> love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when you think of Harvey Weinstein, well, <laughs> right, maybe right. not. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and Fox certainly had much more power than any of these other, and than any of these characters today. So. Uh, so that's so wonderful to hear. I'm I'm happy that uh, uh, that that someone in the industry had that reputation and 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 stood up for for what they believed in. That's that's wonderful. Um, yes. l let's step back just a minute from William Fox and mm -hmm. let's when when you um, decided to tackle this project, um, mm -hmm. did you did you realize the scope of it from? Uh, from the beginning and and how does someone uh, who is working in the magazine industry how do you kind of gear up uh, to tackle a project this size yeah great questions um, I certainly had no idea it was going to be this long or this involved and this complex I thought oh, maybe it would take me say three to five years and it ended up being a 10-year project simply because the story was just, it just kept going off in, in new directions. Um, so perhaps it was good that I didn't know that it was going to be quite that lengthy. Um, maybe I would have had second thoughts, but <laughs> I, I expected at the outside about half the time that it actually took. And in terms of how to go about it, I think that that was not so much of a daunting concern for me in the sense that one of my frustrations as a magazine writer was that I couldn't go longer, that, you know, write a thousand words, write 1,500 words, and that's it. And I would always do much, much more research and have many more things to say, but couldn't say them because there were, you know, there was not the room for that. And then doing the thesis, which was, I think, about 70, 80 pages in graduate school. So that was sort of moving in that direction. Um, I didn't. I didn't find the, that to be an intimidating thought. The the fact of the length, because I, I thought of it more. You break it up into you break the story up into segments, and you tell this piece, and then you tell that piece. So in a sense, it might have been. Sort of, I might have sort of seen it as really just a series of magazine articles that just focus on a different part of his life. Um, what ended up being well, there were many challenges, and. One of the biggest ones was that, and I think one of the reasons why nobody had done him before, is there was no central archive of his papers. And that is what one hopes for in doing a, a project like this. You, you want to be able to go to a library and have them pull out box after box of material that the person has carefully kept or their family has carefully kept and arranged and put neatly into folders and, and, you know, files and boxes and such, and you just go through them and then do some extra research. There was none of that. Um, the studio had kept only very, very scant information from Fox's day. He was there from 1915 through 1930. And th there was just, I mean, there were extra tracks, you know, that was about it. There was really nothing significant. So 
I had to figure out where am I going to get the information. You know, what um, one of the key pieces was the, uh, Upton Sinclair wrote a book in 1932. Upton Sinclair presents William Fox, and that was basically a pen for hire effort. Fox, this is after Fox lost his companies, and he wanted to tell about the conspiracy, the financial conspiracy against him. He hired Upton Sinclair, and Sinclair worked on this for I think, about six or eight months. And, and only use the information that, that Fox gave him. But nonetheless, it was fairly detailed information. It was mostly on the battle for control of the companies that went on in 1929 and 1930. But that, that at least was solid information about that piece. And so that was, and, and somewhat about his earlier life as well. And fortunately, Upton Sinclair had saved that transcript. And given it or sold it to the Lilly Library at Indiana University. So that was a useful piece. That was, you know, a useful kind of core document to have. But it, it by no means was enough. Um, and it wasn't even really the main piece that I used. It was just kind of, or you know, it wasn't like the predominant piece, perhaps, that I used. Uh, so I had to think, where else can I get information? And this is where I think that really the internet transformed the you know the sort of feasibility of this project because the many of the trades were being digitized at that time so i could you know do searches and i could also do searches in the new york times and the la times database and that meant you could find information that you didn't know you know that you didn't even know existed so that was really very beneficial. And then another sort of surprising source of information were lawsuits. And William Fox fortunately loved to sue people. And <laughs> that turned out <laughs> that turned out to be great because I had first thought, well, legal documents are going to be so dry and you just have to kind of wade through them. But in fact, people are telling stories in those documents. And I think they have to be a little bit more wary of telling the truth in those things than in a press release. So you get these stories about, well, where did you meet so-and-so, and how did this happen? And then, you know, I picked up a lot of good information from that. Um, so digging around in, you know, in, in the New York City basement courtroom, you know, where they have the, the old files, um, that was that was helpful. And, um, and mm -hmm, go ahead. No, no, no. Go, finish what you were saying. No, I was also going to say. And then I, I also thought, okay, well, maybe Fox himself didn't talk other than to Sinclair, but certainly he knew a lot of famous people, and he worked with a lot of famous people, and they wrote their memoirs, or they have oral histories done. So that's where I would go to say, okay, let's look at what all of these directors have to say, or let's look at what these actors. And actresses have to say, and pulling in details here and there, and then just you know putting them together in kind of a a patchwork sort of fashion. Did, uh, in the in the midst of all of this research that you're doing, and you're really immersing yourself uh, into uh, the life of a man that's nearly a hundred years ago uh, at the beginning of the story, um, did did family or friends ever? pull you aside and say, okay, Vanda, uh, we're tired of hearing about William Fox right now. You need to take a vacation um, because the man's not alive anymore. <laughs> did you, did, I think you've been you... talking to my friend, Hank. <laughs> because, yes, that did happen. <laughs> Oh, oh the, so so the the question out of that is um, when you are uh, because you you had to be that immersed to get uh, mm -hmm. this level of story that you did, um, but how as the writer do you um, keep from just getting so burned out from just the the overwhelming nature of all the information and you know kind of having to be the arbiter of the truth. Um, you know, uh, nearly a century later, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and just getting worn down by it all. Uh, what What are some of the things that you, as the writer over a ten year period, uh, had to do to keep it fresh and to keep you from just getting disgusted with the whole thing? 
Okay, that also is a great question. Um, your questions are all great, but oh, um, th- that is, you know, honestly, I, I don't think I ever really hit that point because I really felt Fox was such an interesting character that it's almost like he was really still alive. You know, the spirit of him was still alive. Like I could hear him when I would read quotes from him, you know, in some of these lawsuits. And I think another thing that really kept it alive and vibrant for me was my friendship with uh, Angela, his niece. Um, she, it was uncanny. The way that she would tell stories was almost exactly the same way that he would tell stories. The pacing of them was the same, and he, he too, was a, a great storyteller. So I, I think it, it just it. I don't think I ever, I didn't get disgusted with the story. What I got really frustrated with and sort of, you know, angry and weary about was my obtuseness at times when I just couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how does this make sense or what was really going on underneath here. And then the answer really usually was not to step away. The answer was, and this I found to be a pretty a pretty good general rule for me whenever I, you know, hit that sort of situation, is you need more information. You're missing pieces. It's not as if um, I'm not, the problem is not so much that I can't correctly analyze this. It's that I don't have enough to I'm trying to fill in blank spaces and and sort of make things connect when I'm missing the missing piece you know when I don't have that missing piece and so it would be okay go back and and keep looking or look at something you've already looked at and see if you see something different if a fact jumps out at you and that would be what happened a number of times would be that then I would find that one piece of information that brought that piece of that part of the story together and made it make sense. And then, okay, now I've got that. And that was exciting. You know, and that goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning about the detective work where you're looking for, you know, kind of like Sherlock Holmes, you know, it's right there in front of you and and it's the key piece of information, but it looks very ordinary. It doesn't look very significant. But then when you bring it into context with the rest of the information, that's the kind of the piece in the jigsaw puzzle that makes those other two fit together. And that, that was kind of another analogy that I think I had was it seemed like a jigsaw puzzle at times. And I love jigsaw puzzles too. So, you know, there are times when I would be trying to force two pieces together that that don't belong, and you just finally have to admit those don't connect. You know, you're missing that, you're missing a piece in there. So I didn't, um, I didn't, the, the story never seemed dull to me because, you know, A, he was such an interesting character. And the other thing is I really liked him. You know, he was a really decent person. And he tried to be, he he had high ideals and he really tried to live up to them. And I found that very admirable, especially in a historical period where he was surrounded by a lot of corruption and compromise. And he really tried to rise above it. And he he really loved what he was doing. He really loved the motion picture industry and not just promoting his own company and his own works, but also really trying to improve the whole, the industry as a whole and to move it forward. And so I found that sort of selflessness to be very admirable. And that, so as a, as a character, as a person, he, I found it fascinating. Um, I was sitting here smiling as as you were talking about doing the detective work because I knew that it would come full circle back to Nancy Drew before uh-huh. it was over. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. it's a profound influence those books were. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Never, never uh, look with disdain on those early beginnings. They they exactly. always uh, pop back up. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Vanda, what what was something that you uncovered? 
in uh, in the research and in the telling of the story uh, that just absolutely flabbergasted you? Well, let's see. I think that there were there were many things that that really surprised me. I think one of the main things, just from a film history point of view, would be the whole uh, transition to talking pictures. And uh, whenever we think of the first talking picture, we think of Warner Brothers and the jazz singer in 1927. And that it always gets the credit as being the the movie that launched the, the uh, sound era in motion pictures. But as I did my research, what I found out is, well, it really wasn't. I mean, yes, it was the first Hollywood talking picture, but it had a system, the Vitaphone system, which was a record playing along with the with the movie that no other no other major studio adopted, and that I felt that William Fox was really more the key player in that transition. In that he he had been offered to take over the Vitaphone system because. AT&T and Western Electric, which were manufacturing the equipment, really hated the Warner Brothers. They thought, you know, they were sort of bumpkins and they weren't going to handle it correctly and wasn't a big enough company. And here, you know, the phone company is very respectable and hugely um, prosperous. And they wanted sort of a better a better class of partner. And Fox didn't want Vitaphone because he knew as a former exhibitor himself, that's how he started in the industry back in 1904 with a the small theater. He knew that was never going to work, that records would get lost or broken or they'd be mismatched with the film. And also, once the film was made, you would not be able to edit the film at all because you had this record that was had to synchronize with the film, which meant you couldn't cut any, couldn't cut the film at all. And so he advocated very strongly against a lot of resistance, and he actually put a lot of his money in own money into developing the sound on film technology, which was the system he called the system movie tone, and that was what the major studios adopted in the spring of 1928. So I would argue that the Warner Brothers really don't deserve that credit because they had a system that that was I think a novelty and yes it made a sensation but it was not going to be widely adopted and Fox offered the system that that was now he came later with his first talking picture he did not release until the uh until the fall of 1928 he had made newsreel shorts uh you know with his uh, sound on film so that's how he demonstrated it so he was, you know, he was he was second um, to he or he was behind the Warner Brothers in, in releasing that. But I really felt he he's the one who deserves the credit um, for that, and he he didn't get it. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. His uh, uh, they may have beat him to the punch, but he's the one that really innovated. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, yeah. All, you know, although the Bell Labs were of AT and T, they were also working on it, but they. AT&T really wanted the the sound, the sound on disc system. Even they didn't see it. You know, they they, they thought this is an existing technology because it uses a phonograph, and and Fox pushed them to adapt their equipment for sound on film. You know, they were looking at it. The AT&T was looking at it. They really didn't understand the movie business, but they were looking at it, thinking we can get to market faster with this other technology, with the Vitaphone sound on disc and fox was it'll never work you know and and you need to go with the one that that is maybe a little in in a little bit rougher shape but you'll fix that you know you'll improve that and very soon you'll have it up to being a good quality good quality sound which is exactly what happened but had he not pushed that um well actually rca was also working on a on a um sound on film system as well so it gets kind of complicated, but but in terms of what actually happened in the industry, the major studios adopted the Fox movie tone system in 1928, and even the Warner Brothers in 1930 abandoned the the sound on disc. So, 
Wow. Yeah. There's, there, and there are so many stories like that uh, in this book, and mm-hmm. I, I, I wish we had just hours to talk about it because we could we could literally go on uh, all night. But the book is called The Man Who Made the Movies, The Meteoric Rise and Tragic Fall of William Fox. Uh, this book is tremendous. Uh, Vanda, you've done uh, – you can tell that this was a 10-year – um, you know, a uh, heart project that this was something that you really put, uh, put yourself into and, and not just, uh, you know, uh, casually, um, you know, digging up some facts. This is something that you really put your, your heart and soul into. Um, my question for you after that is when you've, mm-hmm. when you put so much into a book, uh, mm-hmm. and you finally get to release day and the book releases, uh, November 28th, uh, just we're, we're recording this on the 15th. So it's just a couple of weeks, uh, before it releases. Um, what do you do when, when something this substantial is finished and you have to walk away and, and go do something else? It's hard. It's, it's very hard <laughs> because as you say, I really, <laughs> it was in many ways, it really was a labor of love. I just felt this is something that needs to be done and it needs to be done right. And in that sense, you know, whatever it takes from me is fine. You know, I'll give it everything I've got. But then, yes, you're right. You have to put it down. You have to turn it in and you have to let it go. And I think a big challenge for me now is is to, I don't think I'm going to find anybody who is that important and, and undiscovered. And so I have to think in a different way about what am I going to do next. And I'll be honest with you, I don't have a great idea at this point. I have some ideas that I'm thinking about, but it's it, it's sad to walk away from somebody that one comes to like and admire so much and who has such a rich and multi-layered story. Um, Because in many ways I feel that he's, his life is really a portrait of his time as well and of the growth of that industry. So he really lived a big life involved in, in many dimensions. And it was a fantastic learning experience for me. But yeah, it is a challenge to, re-enter the real world i think (laughs) well um take some time and enjoy the success of this book i know it's going to be uh, a huge success uh i'm i'm anxious for everyone to run out and get a copy of it and uh and and let's hope that uh that by happenstance uh you know uh, a person crosses your path uh, that that captures your imagination in the same way that william fox did yeah Uh, Mm -hmm. Van de Kraft, it's been a, a a great honor to talk to you. Thank you for taking time to come on the show. Oh, Hank, thank you so much. This has been a really great conversation. You asked fabulous questions, and I feel as if we've just been talking for about five minutes. Um, I I know, yeah. and we're mm-hmm. we're almost an hour in. Um, wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna send everybody to pick up a copy of the book. Do you have a website where where people can connect with you? Um, I will have one up very shortly, and it is uh, it will be vandacreft.com. So it is my first name, V-A-N-D-A, Kreft, K-R-E-F-F-T, dot com. So it will be up uh, probably within the next couple of days. Wonderful. Uh, okay. Vanda, thank you so much for coming cool. on the show. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Natalie? It's Artie. Listen, I'm going to be late for dinner. I ran out of gas on... He climbed out of the car and peered at the sign. On Sleepy Hollow Road... There's nothing but trees, and I have to find a gas station. Save me a drumstick. He hung up his cell and stuck it in his pocket, zipping his jacket. He was going to have to walk and pray somebody picked him up. A sliver of crescent moon hung above, surrounded by clouds, like a grinning drunk asleep in a puddle. Artie walked, using his tablet as a flashlight, eyes on the gravel ahead. He crossed over a dark ravine, The trunks and overhanging branches were matted thick with wild grapevines and threw a cavernous gloom over the road. A figure stood at a crossroads ahead. It looked pale and wan and blue. A woman? He had an impression of fragility and age and thought of his warty old landlady. But his landlady would not be standing at a crossroads in the dark. 
Excuse me? Artie said, surprised by the fear in his own voice. Do you know where I can find a gas station? I'm... I'm empty. Then let me fill you, the figure whispered. It rushed at him. It entered him. He dropped the tablet, fell to his knees, and lost his body to another driver. When Artie woke again, he was dangling in midair. The woods were pitch black. The only lights were fireflies. Fireflies everywhere, like dancing stars. He struggled and cried out, his yellow sneakers trying to find the ground. Shh, said a voice. It will all be over soon. Panic rose. He felt invisible hands on his legs, on his arms, invisible fingers around his neck, reaching up the back of his shirt. He heard the sound of water running below, high and agitated, as if through a stony brook. The crescent moon swung out of the sky, falling into the water. Blood rushed into his cheeks. He realized he had been flipped upside down. He yelled and groped, flecking his own face with spit, helpless to drive away whatever was attacking him. He felt a sharp pain between his shoulder blades, and air flew out of his lungs. A spray of blood hit his cheeks, hot and clinging. His hands found a sharp branch protruding from his body. It had speared him through his back and out through his chest. He tried to say help, but had no air to form the word. Blood poured up his body. No, it poured down. It only felt as if it were rising, climbing his neck, covering his face, gathering in his scalp. He reached for the ribbon of blood that fell from his crown into the trickle of moonlight below. The ribbon slipped through his fingers. It thinned, choked, became a tiny rivulet. His tanks were empty. Not even fumes. His engine began to sputter. The flow became a drip. A maddening drip like the drip, drip, drip of his kitchen faucet. The drip his landlady hadn't fixed. The drip that kept him up at night. This drip would not be keeping him up. He would sleep very well this night. Very well indeed. The fireflies slipped into shadow. A figure appeared. Blue as gaslight bony and toothless, a crone from a fairy tale. Thank you, my friends, she whispered. I am thankful for this good harvest. She neared, scrutinized him with manic intensity, and turned away, muttering to herself in a sing-song rhythm as she too vanished into the trees. A man may toil from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done.